Kazakhstan is a country located in the heart of Eurasia, appeared on the geopolitical map only in 1991. It is bounded on the northwest and north by Russia, on the east by China, and on the south by Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, the Aral Sea and Turkmenistan. The Caspian Sea bounds Kazakhstan to the southwest. Kazakhstan is the largest country in Central Asia and the ninth largest in the world. For centuries, the great Kazakh steppe accepted caravans of the Silk Road in oases of its cities and settlements. It was historically closely tied to the Silk Road trade routes, acting as a crossroads for the movement of people, goods and ideas between Europe and Asia. The capital of Kazakhstan and its largest business center is Nur Sultan. The third megapolis of the country, Shinkyan, is as a city in the south of Kazakhstan with an 800 years history founded in the 12th century. Nowadays, Shimkian is a city of national significance, one of the largest industrial, commercial and cultural centers of the country, the third largest by population of more than one million people. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is located here. It is Awazov University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At Awesef University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkian on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the Awazov University. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best.
father would have done. So let me begin by giving you a little bit of a background on how this theory arose. So string theory arose in, in the late 1960s in an attempt to construct a theory of the strong nuclear force. So this, this is the force that holds neutrons and protons together inside the atomic nucleus. Now, during the 1960s, many new particles were discovered that also experienced the strong nuclear force. And uh, these other strongly interacting particles were named hadrons. And so a, a need arose to develop a theory of hadrons. We wanted to understand why these particles were being discovered and how they all fit together. We, need, we needed a theory to account for them. So that was the original motivation. So I was in Berkeley as a graduate student in the 1960s, and my advisor, uh, Jeffrey Chu, uh, pioneered a, an approach to constructing a theory of hadrons that he called S-matrix theory. And so that's sort of what I was raised on and what I uh, learned uh, in, in, when I was in Berkeley. Now, shortly after I left Berkeley and was in Princeton, there was this incredible paper by uh, Gabriella Veneziano in 1968. And he, he discovered a very simple formula, just some ratio of Euler gamma functions that satisfies many of the S-matrix principles. And so it was really great to have an explicit formula that uh, combined some of the, several of the ideas that went into S-matrix theory. And this, this S-matrix, S stands for scattering, right? Yes, S stands for scattering. Uh, the, what the S-matrix does is it gives you the probability amplitudes for various physical processes where, where, in which particles scatter and result in new particles. So after two years of various, lots of people studying Veneziano's formula and generalizing it, it became clear that, uh, that this formula and its generalizations uh, all arose from a theory that was based on strings, which is the name that was given for these one dimensional objects uh, that are behind these formulas. So th this, this should be in contrast to point-like particles which is what all previous uh, quantum theories are based on. So for example, in the uh, standard model of elementary particles, where there's a whole long list of particles, those are all point-like particles. So, uh, so strings, on the other hand, have spatial extension. They have zero thickness, but, and they have two possible topologies. They can be open strings, which have two free ends, or they can be closed strings, which are topologically loops. They, aren't, they don't have to be circular because they move, move around and undergo various motions, but they're topologically uh, circles. So the basic idea that uh, arose for why one was finding a string and how it would account for all these hadrons was that the string, when you treat it quantum mechanically, has various modes of oscillation and vibration. And the, each of these different modes uh, can be interpreted as describing a specific particle. So all the different hadrons then were, the, the idea was that each of them would be interpreted as a different oscillation mode of the string. So in this sense, there was a unique object, namely the string, and yet there was this great proliferation of particles and they were just different motions of this unique object. So the hope was that such a theory could give a unified understanding of the spectrum of hadrons that was being discovered. Well, as I will explain, that didn't really work out, but it led to some other interesting ideas. So, that, so there were quite a few surprises that are coming, going to appear. So what I'm going to do now is to give you just a very rough idea of how one formulates a relativistic quantum theory for point particles and for strings. Uh, the important point I want to make is the difference between the two cases, point particles and strings, and to explain why strings are in some respects better than point particles. So the crucial concepts for 
this purpose are what are called the world line of a point particle and the corresponding concept for a string, which is called the world sheet of a string. And this can be explained with a picture. So let, let's start with a point particle. So if we, if we make a, a diagram in which time, let's say, goes vertically and one of the spatial directions goes horizontally, the others could be perpendicular to the plane that's shown. And the motion of a point particle is just some line in space-time. And so that line in space-time is called the world line of the point particle. So it's a very simple concept. So even though the particle has zero size, zero thickness, it sweeps out a line as it evolves in time. Now we have an analogous concept for strings. So if we have a closed string, to be, to be specific, and we follow its evolution in time, it sweeps out a two-dimensional surface, which is topologically a cylinder, as, as shown on the right. So that's, so that's the analog of this. So that's the story of free propagation of particles. But in an in a interest, in a non-trivial quantum theory, there are interactions. And the interactions in point particle theories are given by the, uh, what are called Feynman diagrams. Feynman was one of my Caltech colleagues, one of my most illustrious colleagues here at Caltech. And so here I've drawn a couple of illustrative examples of Feynman diagrams. So this first one, again, you see the world line of the particle as before, but here it's bifurcating into two particles. So an interaction occurs at the vertex here. And when in constructing the theory, one has to invent mathematical rules to explain to explain exactly how that interaction contributes to the calculation of the scattering amplitude associated with this process. And there are more and more complicated Feynman diagrams. There are an infinite number of them. And they can be uh, characterized by how many interaction vertices they have. So here's another Feynman diagram, but this one has three interaction vertices. And, and it has what's called a closed loop but it's the same process in which one particle comes in and two go out in the final state. So these are examples of Feynman diagrams in a quantum theory of point particles. Now in string theory, we have analogous pictures, but we have to deal with the world sheet of the string. So we can have a picture uh, in which we start with one closed string, but then as it evolves in time, it bifurcates to give two closed strings at a later time. So this, you could call this the upside down pants diagram, if you like. And uh, the um, crucial difference between this diagram, which you have in string theory and the pictures that we had on the preceding slide for point particle theory is that this can be a smooth surface and there's no specific point on the world sheet at which an interaction occurs. So even though this describes an interaction where one string turns into two, it's given by a smooth surface uh, without any uh, vertices. So that fact is absolutely fundamental. So unlike point particle theories, the Feynman diagrams of string theory uh, are smooth. The world sheets are smooth, unlike Feynman diagrams which have, uh, for point particles, which have interaction vertices. And the consequence of this is that the string theory doesn't have some of the problems that point particle theories have. So in point particle theories, typically the, the, the diagrams that have loops in them give rise are described mathematically by integrals that diverge. And so they're infinite integrals. And dealing with these infinities and these divergent integrals is a big problem and it's a whole major aspect of studying quantum field theory. So the, 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 these divergences are occur at, at short distances. That's why it's associated with an interaction vertex. And they're sometimes called ultraviolet divergences. So in some quantum field theories, when there has ways of handling these ultraviolet divergences, and in other theories, one doesn't. Now in string theory, as I said earlier, the uh, interactions are uniquely determined by the topology of the world sheet theory. So the, so the two consequences are one that you don't have any ultraviolet divergences in string theory. And the other thing is that you don't have any non-uniqueness. If you know the 
free non-interacting string theory. The interacting theory is uniquely determined because it just follows from the topology of these uh, world sheets. Whereas in point particle theories, you have to introduce rules for what mathematical uh, factors you incorporate to describe the interaction of vertices. So forgive, forgive my ignorance. Is the uh, so for basic uh, um, Feynman diagrams that that result in the accurate amplitudes of uh, cro cross sections for particle interactions? Can uh, the the short the no short distance UV divergences can those be uh, can those replicate the same uh, you know or at least some of the basic Feynman diagrams? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're right. So so for example, in the standard model of elementary particles, which is a fantastically successful theory. Uh, you, there are ultraviolet divergences, but they, they are ones that we have good ways of handling. They are what are called renormalizable yeah. ultraviolet divergences. And in those cases, we know how to extract unambiguous finite answers despite these formal infinities in, the, in these uh, intervals. In other theories, for example, if you took Einstein's theory of gravity and tried to treat that quantum mechanically, there the ultraviolet divergences are not of the benign variety. And that's what's called a non renormalizable quantum field theory where it has a real problem. I see, I see. So, so in string theory, there are no ultraviolet divergences, and the interacting theory is uniquely determined from the non interacting. But there were problems. So, the, the, so I told you the good things, some of the good things about string theory. So let me be very honest and tell you about some of the problems that we encountered. The, one of the problems that was encountered around 1970 or 71 was the observation that the original version of string theory actually had an inconsistent mathematical inconsistency unless the dimension of space time was chosen to be 26. 25 spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Now this is, was completely unexpected and certainly not what we wanted. We, we were normal people and we know that there are three space dimensions and one time dimension. So this came as an unpleasant shock. And so we had to figure out how, what to do about this. The original string theory that grew out of the Veneziano formula also had another unrealistic feature and that is that in quantum theories, there are two types of particles called bosons and fermions. And all realistic theories contain both kinds of particles. But in, uh, in this original string theory, there were only bosons and no fermions. So the proton and neutron, for example, are, are examples of, of fermions. So, so you're certainly not going to describe protons and neutrons in a theory that only has bosons. So that was another serious problem. And the original string theory also had an unstable vacuum, which is a very bad thing as well. That's manifested as a tachyon. So in 1971, a second string theory was discovered. And uh, it started with Ramon's work where he wrote, Pierre Ramon wrote down a formula for fermionic strings, a free theory of fermionic strings. And then a month or two later, André Neveu and I uh, wrote, found a second formalism for bosons. And we quickly realized that our bosons had a, naturally interacted with Ramon's fermions and the, whole, and, and the whole thing could be combined into a single theory. And, and this theory, it turned out, required that there should be 10 dimensions of space time, nine space at one time. Well, that again was not what we wanted, but, it, but we felt we were making progress, A, because we had fermions as well as bosons, and B, because we had reduced the number of space dimensions. And so we felt that was a big step in the right direction. And we speculated that maybe we would next find a theory with only free space at one time. But that's not how the history went. The, the history of this subject is very strange, as you will see. So the development of this second string theory led to the discovery of a kind of symmetry that hadn't been considered previously, which was named supersymmetry. 
And supersymmetry is a symmetry that relates the two kinds of particles I mentioned earlier, the bosons and fermions. So ordinary, more ordinary type symmetries only relate bosons to bosons and relate fermions to fermions. But this new kind of symmetry, supersymmetry, relates bosons to fermions. As yet, there's no experimental evidence for fermion, uh, for supersymmetry, but, but most theorists believe that eventually it will show up. In any case, strings and theories that have supersymmetry are usually called superstring theories. So, so the original version that we wrote down had some slight defects, which were improved a few years later, and that improved version of our theory then is what we call superstring theory. So both of these string theories had another problem, the 26 dimensional bosonic string theory and the 10 dimensional superstring theory have oscillation modes for the strings that correspond to massless particles. And there are massless particles in nature, but we were trying to describe hadrons, the, the particles that have strong interactions and none of the hadrons are massless. So finding massless particles was a Again, a disturbing fact and was regarded as a defect of the theory. So we tried for a few years to construct another string theory that describes only massive particles in four dimensional space time. But all such attempts were unsuccessful. When it, each, each proposal always ended up with giving rise to some inconsistency somewhere along the line. So the, so the, so the more, more one tried to find new theories, the more one became convinced of the uniqueness of these particular theories. Besides we don't have to this theorem, but, there, but it's clear from everything we know, even, even 50 years later, that, uh, that these theories have a high level of uniqueness to them. Now, the, the, what happened was that in 1973, so just two years after this, uh, superstring theory was developed, a theory of a strong nuclear force called QCD or quantum chromodynamics was developed. And this is a more traditional uh, quantum field theory based on point particles called quarks and gluons. And it very quickly became clear that this is the correct theory of the strong nuclear force. I believed it, my friends believed it uh, immediately. I mean, the evidence was overwhelming. And so, so what happened was that uh, string theory was abandoned by almost all of its practitioners, practically certainly within a year or so. And what had been a community of several hundred very enthusiastic string theorists was reduced just to a handful of diehards uh, after the discovery of QCD. So I was one of these diehards. So I have to explain why, why we did not give up on string theory. And uh, well, I was working with Joël Scherk, a French collaborator of mine at the time. And we felt that the string theory was just too beautiful not to be good for something. So, and, and so we, we realized what that something is. And so I wanna explain that. So the, we, we realized that string theory is good for unifying the fundamental forces. So, to explain what that means, I have to explain briefly exactly what it is we wanted to unify. So there, there are two things. So there's the standard model. So very quickly after the discovery of QCD, the whole picture of the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force and electromagnetic forces were combined into what is now called the standard model. So this was all formulated in the mid 1970s. And it's incredibly successful. Even the latest experiments carried out at, at the CERN Large Hadron Collider give overwhelming agreement with the standard model. It predicts the existence of the Higgs boson, which was discovered there in particular. There are a couple tiny hints in the data nowadays for possible breakdowns of the standard model, but they do not yet have the statistical significance to, to, to be called a discovery. So with the standard model is one pillar of modern particle physics. And the other pillar is general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, which he formulated in 1916. 
Now, general relativity is a beautiful classical field theory. But as I mentioned earlier, when you try to quantize it, treat it quantum mechanically, it has these non renormalizable ultraviolet divergences. And so it cannot by itself be consistently interpreted as a quantum theory. So let me just say a, a little bit more about the standard model in general relativity, but I'll be very brief. So the standard model is a relativistic quantum field theory that combines QCD, the theory of the strong nuclear <coughs> force, the weak nuclear force, and electromagnetic forces. And it's incredibly successful. The standard model describes the properties and interactions of particles that has a half a unit of spin. These are fermions, quarks, and leptons. An example of a lepton is the electron. The quarks are in QCD are the particles that make up the proton and neutron. It has particles that carry the forces, which have one unit of spin, and those would include the photon, which is the particle that makes up light, electromagnetism, photon, and the spin zero Higgs particle, which was predicted by the standard model and discovered uh, nine years ago at, at CERN in the large LHC. Now the main shortcoming of the standard model is first of all, it doesn't contain gravity, but also it has many arbitrary features for which we would like to find a deeper explanation. So gravity, as I mentioned, is Einstein's 1960 theory that he called general relativity. And it describes gravity in terms of the geometry of space and time. And this geometry is characterized by a metric for Riemannian geometry. And that, that, that's a symmetric matrix. Uh, and th this Einstein's theory predicted the existence of black holes and gravitational waves both of which uh, have become hot topics in recent years, as I'm sure you're aware. When this metric in relativity, in, in general relativity, is treated as a quantum field, one learns that the gravitational force should be mediated by a spin two particle called the graviton. The graviton, as an elementary particle, will interact incredibly weakly because gravity is a weak force. And so it is unlikely that an individual graviton will ever be observed, unlike the photon, which you observe with relative ease. But their existence is really, in my view, a beyond dispute. <laughs> what we do observe are the classical waves, which are made up of gravitons acting in a coherent manner. So, so the Remarkable thing that we realized in 1974 is that one of the massless particles in string theory, which is a mode of a closed string, has precisely the right properties, zero mass and spin two, to be the graviton, the particle responsible for the gravitational force. So when we were trying to describe hadrons, this thing was a problem. But now when we realized, gee, maybe this could be good. String theory doesn't have ultraviolet divergences and it has a graviton. And it agrees with general relativity at ordinary energies. It's only at exceedingly high energies that its predictions would differ from those of general relativity. So we got very excited, Joel Scherk and I, that, um, that, uh, that the way to uh, save string theory is to use it to describe gravity. So, in a sense, although this is historically not what happened, you could say that string theory predicts the existence of gravity because it was a feature that we tried so hard to get rid of and were unable to do. So it's actually a feature of string theory. So in addition to the massless closed strings, which give spin two particles, there are massless open strings, which give spin one particles, and these, have the properties like those that are responsible for the forces in the standard model. The electromagnetic, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear forces are all mediated by massless spin one particles. Well, actually some of these symmetries are broken and then, the, then some of these particles acquire mass, but the uh, photon uh, remains massless. So in 1974, uh, Sherkin and I proposed that using string theory 
to unify all forces, including gravity. We certainly didn't see in detail how one was going to get the electromagnetic weak nuclear and strong nuclear, but, we, but it was clear that theories of that general type uh, would be possible. So we stumbled upon what you could call a realization of Einstein's dream. Einstein in his later years was trying to unify his general theory of relativity with, 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 with electrodynamics and electromagnetic force. The nuclear forces were not well known in the 1940s and 50s when he was working on these things. In any case, there was no way he could have succeeded because there were crucial issues that were not a few crucial facts like the existence of these nuclear forces that Einstein didn't have access to. Now, let's talk about how big strings are. When we were using strings to describe hadrons, their size had to be comparable to the size of a proton or a neutron, and that's about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So that's how big we were imagining these strings would be. So that, that's a, that the only free parameter in the string theory is a length scale. So, so, that, so that is the length scale we would input into the string theory if we want to describe hadrons. But to account for gravity, we want we, we have we found that we do have gravity. We want to make sure that it has the right strength, and the strength is given by Newton's constant. So the way to figure out how big a string should be is to take the fundamental constants h, which is the Planck's constant for quantum theory, g, which is Newton's constant for gravity, c, which is the speed of light for relativity. Put them together, you make a length. We put in the numbers and it's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters right? So that's what the typical size of a string should be if we want gravity to have Newtonian strength, which we do. So in changing the purpose of string theory from describing hadrons to describing unification, we suddenly shrunk our strings by 20 orders of magnitude, which is comparable to the ratio of the size of the solar system to the size of an atom. So it was a rather big change in viewpoint, but math stayed the same. So it wasn't really all that hard. So the strings shrunk by 20 orders of magnitude. Now, prior attempts to construct a quantum version of general relativity were based on point particles, quantum field theory. And as I mentioned earlier, they always gave rise to infinite results that don't make sense because they have non what in the jargon of the business are called non-renormalizable ultraviolet convergences. And by contrast, string theory is UV finite for the reasons that I explained earlier, for the smooth world sheet. Now in a theory of gravity, such as general relativity or string theory, the geometry of space and time is determined by the dynamics. Remember, general relativity describes gravity in terms of the geometry of space. In time. So string theory therefore also just has space-time geometry. But we remember we had extra dimensions. But when string theory is used to describe gravity rather than the strong interaction, it makes sense to consider solutions of string theory, of the string theory equations, in which the extra dimensions form a compact space, a very small space, such as a sphere or a torus or something more complicated. So if the extra dimensions form a tiny space, if it's sufficiently small, it won't be observable. And the space time that one observes could look four dimensional, even though there are six extra dimensions. This tiny six dimensional space would be attached to each point in four dimensional space time. So if the compact space is small enough, it is not observable at low energies. And so far, there is no experimental evidence for extra dimensions. So that tells us they have to be very small, because otherwise we wouldn't see them. So space can appear to be three-dimensional if the uh, extra dimensions curl up in this way. So remarkably, the geometry of the invisible compact dimensions has important physical consequences. It determines the types of particles and forces that occur in ordinary four-dimensional space-time, even at very low energies. 
So even though these dimensions are invisible, understanding their geometry becomes essential for understanding the world we observe because it determines the types of particles and forces that one sees in four dimensions. So, so that's where things stood in 1974. And then for the next 10 years or so, I worked with Michael Green and Lars Brink and one or two other people uh, developing this stuff. And there was no interest in it <laughs> outside of our small little group uh, and, the, and the rest of the theoretical physics community. But that changed very suddenly. So let me explain how that happened. So an important property of the standard model is what's called parity violation. So this is an asymmetry under mirror reflection. So if you imagine taking a movie of some nuclear process and then playing that back side reversed or looking at it in a mirror, if you understood the rules very well, you could tell that the mirror image was wrong because it violates the fundamental equations, whereas the original thing is not. So this fact that the mirror image looks wrong is what is parity violation. So, so the fundamental, so the standard model knows the difference between left and right and treats them differently. Now, parity violation is difficult to reconcile with quantum mechanics. So if the standard model, it does reconcile well and it's consistent, but if you just wrote down some random quantum parity violating quantum theory, uh, for example, if you took the standard model and kept the quarks and threw away the leptons, it would be inconsistent. And the inconsistencies arise from some one loop effects uh, called anomalies. And so the fact that these anomalies cancel in the standard model is a important success of the standard model. Now, for a long time, it was unclear whether parity violation is possible in string theory. And if we want to understand, if we want, ex want to use string theory to describe the real world, it better be possible because we know there is parity violation in the real world. So in 1984, Michael Green and I discovered an anomaly cancellation mechanism that makes parity violation possible in superstring theory. So in, in the superstring theory, as we understood it prior to this work, the symmetry, there were an infinite number of possibilities for the symmetry structures that one could uh, put in to the 10 dimensional theory. But after this anomaly uh, was understood, uh, we saw that only two of this infinite number of possibilities, only two special groups of symmetries uh, were consistent with anomaly cancellation. And th this result convinced many theorists that superstring theory could give a deeper understanding of the standard model as part of a consistent quantum theory containing gravity. So after more than a decade in the doldrums, uh, string theory became a hot subject in the mid 1980s, and it's remained one uh, ever since. So, what, one of the first questions that was addressed after uh, it became a hot subject was specific proposals for what to do with the six extra dimensions. And one, uh, one idea that was proposed in 1985 was to choose for the six extra dimensions a particular kind of geometry called a kalabi yau space, named for two mathematicians. And that this type of, of a space, of a space manifold, uh, has many attractive features. It would give rise to a theory in four dimensions with many realistic features. In 1985, one was impressed by all the things that came out right, and one tended not to pay much attention to the things that didn't work. But uh, after a few years, people got wiser and realized if, if, if anything doesn't work, then it's no good. Everything, it's all or nothing. So, so even though these Calabi spaces had many successes, so far, none of them has given exactly what we want. So we don't know yet whether there is a six dimensional space that will make contact with exactly the observed physics that we have at low energies or not. But, but that 
but there have been many thousands of papers trying to do that. In the 1980s and 90s, there were various surprising features of these string theories that were discovered. So in the, by 1985, we knew of five different versions of superstring theory. And, uh, uh, and it turned out that these are actually all equivalent and that, that they're related by things called dualities. And so, uh, so I'll just say a little bit of what these dualities are. So that they, they, they give you a way of realizing that one theory that you think is different from another is actually part of the same theory. So one kind of duality is what was called T duality. The T doesn't stand for anything in particular, it's just the name that was given to it. So if we take just as a simple unrealistic case, there's a situation where we take one extra dimension to be a circle. So we just imagine that space-time is nine dimensions and one dimension forms a circle. It's not realistic, but we can talk about it. And, uh, and take this circle to have radius r. And then it turns out that this can be equivalent to another string theory, which also has a circle uh, of, for its 10th dimension. Uh, and, but that circle and this other theory has radius l squared over r, where l is the fundamental string length scale. So this is very bizarre. So it, a circle of radius r from one point of view is equivalent to a circle of radius l squared over r from a different viewpoint. And uh, the, this equivalence means that the two theories are actually different limits of the same theory. Because if you send r to infinity, you come, you reach one of our 10 dimensional theories. You send r to zero, you reach the other of our 10 dimensional theories. So, so this, uh, reduce the number of theories. The reason circles of different size can look the same is because space is being probed by strings and strings experience space differently than point particles do. So I, to say more along those lines, I'd have to get go into mathematical detail, but let me leave it at that. So T duality implies that strings probe space-time differently from point particles. In string C, certain space-time singularities and certain topology changing transitions of space as smooth and well-defined. This reflects in a way that smoothness of the world sheet that we were discussing earlier. And this is a significant improvement on general relativity, where, where these singularities are a real problem. Now, a second kind of duality generalizes something that was known for a long time in electromagnetism. Namely, if you look at Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, there's a kind of symmetry between electricity and magnetism. Uh, the, Maxwell's equations are symmetric under interchange of electric and magnetic charges and fields. The, the, the asymmetry in nature is the fact that we know of electric charges, we haven't seen any magnetic charges, so nature treats electricity and magnetism differently, but Maxwell's equations treat them in a symmetric manner. And this symmetry has a dramatic generalization in string theory, which is called S-duality. And what S-duality does in string theory is it relates a theory that has an interaction, interaction strength given by a coupling constant G, which is just a dimensionless small number. And it relates it to a different string theory where has an interaction strength given by the reciprocal of G. So one theory has interaction strength G, the other has an interaction strength one over G and they're equivalent. So, so th this is great because once you've identified this kind of a relationship, it means that uh, you know how, how these theories belong, behave at strong coupling where G becomes infinite because you just interpret it as the other theory with G becoming small. So, uh, so, the, the, so this equivalence told us how uh, this plus the t-duality uh, gave us the large G behavior of three of the five basic superstring theories. But that still left open the question of what the other two superstring theories do in strong coupling. And what happened in those cases is that when G becomes, becomes large, uh, 
which we discovered as a, quite a surprise, is that they grow in 11th dimension of size g times L. So the reason we didn't see this originally was because we were studying the theory as an expansion in powers of g, which means we were doing expansion about g equals zero. And when you're expanding about g equals zero, you don't, you don't see a, a dimension of size g times L. So this new dimension is a circle in one of these two cases and a line interval in the other one. So when you put all this together with all the, this M theory and the SAT duality, we were able to conclude that there's in fact a unique theory uh, underlying that we made these mathematical constructions. Another thing that was discovered in the 80s and 90s is that these theories contain all sorts of funny structures. Besides the fundamental strings, uh, they contain all sorts of additional objects called p braids. And p is just an integer. And it's a, so it's a made up word meant to generalize the notion of a membrane. So p is supposed to represent the number of spatial dimensions that the object occupies. So a point particle in this notation is a zero brain. The string is a one brain and, and so forth. And so this M theory has two kinds of stable brains. It has a two brain and a five brain. In 11 dimensions, there's plenty of room for five brain. So, so I've just given you a few of the highlights of things that were discovered in the last century. And I haven't even told you about some of the amazing things that have happened in the 21st century. Uh, we can explore those in the question period if you like. In any case, I think it's likely that we've identified the unique theory that incorporates dynamical gravity in a consistent quantum theory. However, this theory has an enormous number of solutions. Sometimes it's the landscape of the theory. And we need to figure out which one of these solutions describes our specific universe. Some people speculate that there are other universes where other solutions are realized. This is, seems to me is kind of metaphysics because you can't observe them. So You'll never know. In any case, some features are shared uh, by all solutions and are therefore predictions of the theory, and others are shared by none of the solutions, and uh, th those form what are called the swamp land. And so knowing that, a that some feature belongs to the landscape means that that's a prediction of something that must be true in nature, and knowing that something belongs to the swamp land means that that's something you say must not happen in nature. So, so, that we, so string theory can make predictions in these two categories. It, uh, of course, it's not always easy to know uh, what features of the world fit into the landscape of the swamp land. Uh, but, uh, but the people are working hard on, on this question and there, there are some, some successes along those lines. So to conclude, String theory has evolved remarkably over the past 50 years. It's influenced the development of pure mathematics, as well as some aspects of other areas of physics. 